to the cloud. Are we recording? Yeah. Okay. Great. I think we're recording now. So welcome to the seventh meeting of the DAPS working group, IPFS DAPS working group. Um, yeah, we are, uh, you know, uh, meeting to uh, discuss some of the progress that we're making on a bunch of different initiatives. Um, and uh, for the meeting notes for today, I've already put, uh, you know, we usually start with some status updates um, on some of the ongoing initiatives. But just to sort of recap, what, what we're doing here is we're trying to establish verified retrieval uh, as the norm for retrieving seeds on the web. And uh, as part of doing that, also decreasing the reliance on centralized, uh, sorry, on trusted gateways um, by using the trustless gateway uh, spec um, and just generally trying to sort of uh, improve the experience of dApps on IPFS with better tooling. And uh, that is tooling both for developers and for users. So with that, um, I thought that uh, uh, we could start maybe with Helia Verified Fetch. Uh, you have probably a link to the meeting notes. I've shared that in the uh, chat. Um, so if there's anything else you would like discussed, feel free to just open the HackMD. You just need to be logged in if you want to edit anything. Um, and with that, I thought, you know, maybe it's good to, we start with the uh, Verified Fetch pull request. So the initial release was merged. Um, sorry, the initial pull request was merged for verified fetch. Um, and it seems like the only, the main thing that's still open is this discussion that we're having about how to handle DAG Seabor. Um, is that right, Alex? Yeah. Yeah, just the weird edge cases of Seabor, DAG Seabor, sorry, which can contain types that you can't round trip into JSON. Mm -hmm. is, is is there anything that we want discussed here or are we best keeping it on uh, the, the discussion async in GitHub? I think the nice thing about GitHub is that there's a documentation trail of how we arrived at the conclusion because it's going to affect how people use the library. Right. I, like I, I guess the one thing, go on. I so, you know, we can also surmise, if we have a discussion here, we can surmise on the issue too. Lytle or Dean, you guys have feedback here? Anything, any update on that? Or do you guys need to read the, the comments? Um, I think I can pull it up. I, I think Lytle had looked at it, but let me, uh, let me see. Yeah, yeah, I dropped the comments because I feel it's like important to not break the patterns that we've established. And the, the, the general pattern is, <clears throat> Unless, unless you use Unix FS and you've put your J, they, your data as JSON on Unix FS or a Roblox, you what what you have is a Doug Sibor CID, um, but you that's like a storage format. The way developers work on that is uh, by uh, by a means of safe subset of JSON, so it's effectively the Doug JSON. Um, is what people work with mentally. It just happens to be represented as Dexibor. Um, and what I, I, th I think like the example I gave in the last comment probably is the good TLDR is that like if people put JSON, it gets stored at Dexibor and then they use a verified fetch to read it back. Uh, the expectation is uh, that the dot JSON from the fetch API should give them the same JSON that they put initially into IPFS. And, and that's kind of like my ask that we don't break that flow for developers. Uh, something that oh, I, I also hinted at the end is that like we, when it comes to like fetch API, we have our accept header, like uh, that we have content types. So um, if uh, developer wants uh, JSON, they can request the Daxibor 
as application JSON, and then the JSON function will work correctly. Or it could be triggered imp implicitly. If they called the JSON, then the accept header could be sent virtually, uh, set virtually to application JSON, and you get the JSON. But if you want the raw CBOR bytes, then you can set application, uh, the, the content type for the DAC CBOR, and then you can read raw bytes and uh, do kind of like in use, like do parsing in user land, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, the, the kind of like the question is that it's that like solving the technical problem that uh, Alex uh, mentioned or not, but I think that's the conversation we should have on, on the pull request. Um, Yeah, I mean, so the thing is that, like, when you request the data for the CID, you don't know ahead of time if that block is going to have DAG CBOR that can't be parsed as JSON. So it's like, what do you do? Do you try to parse as JSON and then fail? Yeah, just uh, In which case, the user can, I mean, yeah. And like, yeah, because the user can just re-request the block as raw and then they can use IPLD uh, DAG CBOR to decode it. Yep. When yep. you say yep. fail, you're saying it would fail because it would have a CID in it? Uh, well, it like the CIDs, so if you actually just or use the JSON bytes. parser, the JSON decoder to decode it, then you get you get the happy forward slash string yeah. structure back for a CID. That's not a problem. The problem is when you have big ints, or you have uh, UNA arrays and and these rich data types that JSON doesn't have. So internally, you create a request object uh, and you set the body. So for the for the JSON uh, command to, or for the JSON function to work, the body has to be parsable as JSON. Which, if you get DAG CBOR, obviously it isn't because it's just a bunch of bytes. So you decode it. You then you JSON stringify it, and then you set the body of the response as that string then the JSON method works. Um, but if you can't JSON stringify it because it contains big ints or whatever, then you're in trouble. So you can throw or you can try and uh, encode them in the JSON safe like subset. So you turn big ints into strings and you turn you and eight arrays into a slash object with a key of bytes and then a base64 string of the bytes. Um, but then you're going pretty far from like how the other modules work when they return you a rich object. But I don't know if that's a problem or not. Because you can always call a ray buffer. Like if you care deeply about having uh, consistent object returns, you can always just use a ray buffer. Um, although having said that, if you use a ray buffer and you've stringified an object to set the body to be a JSON string, suddenly the array buffer doesn't work anymore because you get an array buffer of a JSON string uh, and you've lost the fact that you had a UNA array or a big int or whatever. You just have the, the parsed values. Yeah. So there are like, you know, technical limitations, but then there's, there's this like a golden path that people will follow. Like, People usually just call either .json or array buffer. It will be rare for people to call one and then try the second one. The other thing is like all those like types which are problematic and they are also like mentioned in the specs uh, from the IPLD spec website. They are like theoretical problems, but in practice, people are putting or already like compliant subset of JSON and store that as Cyborg. So like in practice, on the when the data is onboarded onto IPFS and stored as CBOR, in that event, I think the input is already sanitized to the safe subset. That's my understanding. Because developers who do not follow the safe subset, they run into problems and then they go with safe subset. That's my understanding. I think I think there are people who there are people who use bytes. I don't know how how common you, the big ints are, but certainly people certainly people use bytes. Um, yeah, but you can round trip bytes. There's like a representation in DAC uh, JSON for that. So if you follow that, yeah. it works. Yeah. 
is it fair to say so, so one question i still have is that whether if you define essentially the accept header can you still retain the optionality or is there a decision that we have to make in the code base for verified fetch about how it's going to be handled if we want the JSON method to return an object deserialized from JSON, then we have to set the request body to be a JSON string. Okay. Okay. So basically for JSON to work, say on DAG Seaboard that has these custom types, we have to actually uh, deserialize the uh, binary that we get back and then actually transform it. And then because we're already transforming it, we have to make that decision. Exactly. But then going back a little step. So if I define that I want just a binary in the accept header, then does that mean that verified fetch can just sort of skip doing any deserialization and just give me the array buffer so that I can handle it? Exactly. Okay. So then that, so if that path is always available and it's not impacted by whatever decision we make, then even if we make the decision to sort of deviate from how we handle it in the DAG Seabor module, like the Helia DAG Seabor module, the user still, so if in verified fetch, the dot JSON will automatically uh, transform some of those types in a way that's different. For example, the links will be, uh, you know, the link objects rather than SID instances. If we do that, then that still, the user still has the ability to just set the accept header and to go down the route of like, having the consistent behavior with DAG Seabor, but the dot JSON will just give the sort of the subset that automatically um, makes it um, compatible with JSON. Is that correct? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, it's okay. just like, you know, if you... Like... I guess the con the concern is just like it's just making it as obvious as possible to the user like what they need to do to succeed. Um, I you you know, usually find if you're if you're messing around with accept headers you've lost. <laughs> like they're they're always the worst kind of devx um, of like yeah, rest yeah. and and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, as long as as long as we make it obvious. Do we are we aware of any like DAP users that are relying on on DAG Seabor? Um, because like I have not actually seen it in any of the open source projects uh, being used in the wild, um, like any of the DAPs. But I mean, for what it's worth, you know, the, the most a lot of them are just using really Unix FS to to store JSON, from what I've seen. So it's like. Yeah, so a lot of them are doing that. There are some that are we're using this. You know, it depends on the, the type of DAP. I think there there are some folks who were uh, using this like DAG Seabor pathing with a terminal element of UnixFS for their like NFT data. Um. Which is sort of how we got into the Unix effect, the DAG Seabor in paths anyway, because uh, it sort of wasn't supposed to be there, but it was loose, so someone did it, and then it, then then we got stuck with it. Um, there, Wait, is this a case also... of DAG Seabor yeah. for metadata, and then the Unix FS yeah. is pointing to like a JPEG? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then there are other groups that, that, you know, use, use these types more heavily, right? Like, like, you know, uh, like, you know, ceramic or Filecoin that, that like actually use, uh, actually use those types for stuff. Um, but yeah, a lot of the stuff, uh, a lot of the things that look, that are like, you know, website front ends that interact with the blockchain thing are just using files that look like front ends, which are all just UnixFS stuff. So I know Mozin, you're you're from the ceramic team, right? Um yep. are you familiar with any of these efforts? I think you may have joined the previous session, but I'm just curious whether you're is this relevant for any of the work that you're doing in in ceramic um this whole verified fetch 
um, library that we're working on. So this is the first session I'm attending. Um, so kind of building a little bit of context. Um, this may be useful to us a little bit down the line, and I can uh, provide a little bit of context on that later. Um, but yes, it's definitely interesting and probably relevant for us. And a lot of what you're doing is working actually with Dag Jose. Yes. Is that, is that right? Yeah, Dag Sibor and Dag Jose. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't mean to derail too much, but is there any support in like the uh, JS libraries for Dag uh, Jose? There is. Yeah, there's actually there's an example on explore.ipld.io that I put together. Uh, or last year. Pretty um, pretty sure Dag Jose was in JavaScript before it was in anything else. Yep. Okay. Dag, there was an example. I might have removed it. Yeah. Oh no, that, that yeah, is yeah. It. Sweet. That's the one. Okay. Um uh, well, I mean, you, you have the link to the meeting notes, um, Mosin. If there's anything that comes up, feel free to engage in any of the PRs. Um or just share feedback for some of the things that you think are relevant. Um, uh, with that, I thought it might be good to um, move on to the service worker gateway that you're working on, Russell. Um, do you want to just give a sort of a quick overview of what you've been working on and maybe share anything that's relevant? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, um, the Helios Service Worker Gateway was put together last year. Uh, Adine um, did a talk on that um, in Brussels or Istanbul. Um, and uh, basically we were, it was kind of in a proof of concept sort of mode where we were um, showing that people can, you know, use an IPFS gateway fully from their browser. So, you know, each of the clients are registering a service worker and pulling down um, IPFS content, including full websites, um, you know, just using Helia running entirely in the browser. Um, or the, at the time, it wasn't using Helia. I believe it was just using uh, um, a raw HTTP request to a trustless gateway. Um, but now it's using Helia um, and uh, verified fetch. And so um, I just deployed it to uh, sw.sergeantpookie.com. Um, and so, you know, you can see that it loads the entire sort of web UI. Um, it registers the service worker on first load. So if you go to something new, if we get like a, a new CID, um, I normally just go to like explore.ipld.io uh, to the XKCD ones and then get a new. Um, I'm trying now the uh, one of the uh, Uniswap releases actually. Okay. So, so here this page registering... right here. Yeah. This, if it's a big, if it's a large content, like that will say, Hey, registering the service worker and redirecting, it's not actually doing that anymore. It's actually like querying for the content, but this page is what registers the service worker. That's like the main landing page. And then the service worker is actually requesting this stuff on the back end. Um, so um, yeah, it, yep. It, it registers a service worker for each new subdomain and then request the content, you know, fully from your browser using Helia. Um, yep. That's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, there was, uh, there's some cert handling that needs to be, uh, fine tuned for the IPNS uh, domains, but interesting. Yeah, but that's the Uniswap site. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I just went to the uh, Uniswap releases page and just took one of their uh, release SIDs um, and just tried it. Nice. Yeah, I just I just put up just deployed it on that site yesterday. Wanted to make sure we could actually um deploy it and it would work, you know, um in a 
deployed site versus local where, you know, it's depending on um, me running the, you know, Webpack dev server and Nginx locally, this is, um, you know, deployed using, it's on a droplet from DigitalOcean um, with a very simple Nginx config and cert bot to get the let's encrypt certificates. Um, and it's pretty, pretty straightforward. But I had, a, I had a ton of issues with my droplet from DigitalOcean that I hadn't, you know, messed with for 10 years. So it took me longer than it should have. But that wasn't the, an issue with this particular uh, deployment. And this is really just a simple server that's returning the same static response for any request that it gets. So it's like there's nothing Yep. just flagging it since this is recorded. So. Okay, I guess, so one of the questions that comes up to me, I was, I was already going through the code um, for this, is uh, what is this, uh, there's kind of like two use cases that I can imagine arising from this. The one is um, we have a bunch of these kind of very light service worker-based gateways. Um, and uh, anyone can deploy it. It should be easy enough. You know, if we polish the configuration, we make it easy enough, then um, that's easy. We still have to figure out, okay, how can we verify whatever that initial payload is? And perhaps, you know, doing some simplification around the code. The second one is that you like then import this, something like this into your code. Um, have you spent much time thinking about, you know, some of these trade-offs just because of like, like the deploying it via a service worker for somebody to deploy that way versus like a full website. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, mostly I think, um, we wanted to get it working locally to prove, you know, verified fetch with this, with this PR. Um, but I, there's a separate sort of ask to deploy a uh, service worker, uh, Helia gateway as like, um, like a, uh, what is it called? Workbox plugin and, and different things where people can just consume in their own websites. Uh, I don't, I don't plan on handling that in this PR, but um uh yeah it should be should be pretty straightforward to do the service worker itself is like two large functions but it's really just a um fetch handler if you look at the source um in sw.ts um yeah i'll just open up the yeah. branch and there's some smarts that can be done. You know, there's some things that can be done better for like uh, error handling on registering, registering the service worker like it is and things like that. But yeah, so that fetch handler is like the main thing that's called. And then all just helper functions around the self ad event listener fetch. Um, like those are the really only two things that you need for the service worker to work. And then it's just... Um, parsing and determining context and and different things like that there's still a yeah. ton of logging enabled that that you know needs to be cleaned up but so a couple of things that i think are sort of like nicer or interesting here so one is that um you can This basically, like, if you want to change things slightly about how the gateway operates, like the deployment of the new thing is cheap. Um, it's not, you know, at the moment where we have to do this thing with uh, the Nginx return the same page every time. Um, so it's not quite as easy as like just deploy a GitHub pages thing, but like it's still pretty cheap in the scheme of things. Um, and, uh, you know, so if you're like, oh, I'd like to, you know, I I don't want to use this ENS, you know, ENS resolver. I want to use this one. Or I noticed you don't support handshake domains. Here's the place I'd like to use to resolve handshake domains. Or, um, I mean, even if you wanted to, I guess, layer on top of this to change, um, you know, so you could support non-UnixFS uh, or like, 
DAG JSON or DAG CLOR like terminal elements. You could do that, and it wouldn't mean that you have to run a big heavy thing that has to you know proxy all the bytes in the world just for it to like work in a browser. Um, and then hopefully yeah. over time we can we can also move more of the actual fetching work into the browser. Um, to some extent, that was one of the learnings from last time around, right? The uh, the version in that I I demoed in Brussels had um, a didn't have something like the the verified fetch that looks like the looks much closer to the gateway API. It was like a little more YOLO. Um, but the other was that it, it was actually trying to like go to the network and, and fetch data, um, from nodes that had it, but the only nodes available were that you could download with were nodes that spoke, uh, web transport and Chromium has this nasty web transport bug. So, uh, kind of like is a pain right now. Um, and so kind of like, all right, step back, focus more on fetching from, from gateways because we don't really care where we get the blocks from and get them from gateways too. Um, and then as, you know, things in, you know, things in Chromium for web transport get better or we have, you know, WebRTC support or there are more nodes that are serving um, blocks over HTTP, which is what groups like uh, like Web three dot storage or a variety of Filecoin SPs are doing. Um, as more of that is happening, then we can also switch to going directly to uh, users to pull the data instead of through gateways. Um. Another thing, I don't, I don't know how complicated this is, but if we, if we do get uh, one um, service worker, you know, Helia service worker gateway stood up, like people can proxy to that front end, those front end assets, like, and that'll probably be the easiest way to deploy because it's just a front end. Um, like, it would be so easy for multiple people to stand up their own like polished URL for it and and just have that work. Um, but yeah, the cost of running this is uh, like it's practically nothing. Um, so if yeah, for people that already have servers, you know, it's more than free for people that don't like maybe five dollars if you go with the droplet, but I already have one that I was using for stuff so. Basically, de decouple trust from infrastructure costs, right? So, like, you know, even if, even if, say, like IPFS.io and Cloudflare and a, and a bunch of other folks are like doing all of the heavy lifting, it doesn't mean that you're inherently trusting them for the like validity and security of your data. You can, you can trust whoever you want, even if they don't have the expertise or dollars to stand up large infrastructure thing. Is there any uh, status update on WebRTC? Because I imagine that as long as we have that challenge with web transport first being only supported by, I think, Chromium right now, and also that limit specific limitation that we have on the number of uh, web transport connections that we can open, I guess WebRTC is where we can expect to have more success. We, what's the sort of the state of the go side of things? Because that's where I feel, as far as I'm aware, that's where it's kind of like hanging I and mean, I can see aching brain. Yeah, I mean, TLDR, work in progress. There aren't, so that's, that, this is one of the higher priority things that's going on in, in Gola P2P, but, um, you know, needs, needs more, uh, more people, eyes, or time. Uh, there, there are it's things that we birthday. can do on it's not my uh, birthday anytime soon but I will fake my birth date if it means I could have this on my birthday and that could be like tomorrow um, uh, the web transport story can also get can also get better even without some of the direct like chromium fixing bugs 
Um, you can't really fix it until they fix the bugs, but you can get around some of it. Like they're they're overly harsh on how they penalize dials to peers that are unavailable. Um, and in peer to peer networks, you talk to a bunch of peers, and sometimes they're not around. And having a really harsh penalty every time you try to talk to someone Sorry. who's not there is like miserable. But as long as we're doing delegated routing anyway, um, you could also reasonably ask the delegated routing service to like better prioritize peers that to like do a little more work to validate that peers are online before they hand them to you, which could also reduce like the load and get around some of the bugs that are happening there. Um, and they are bugs in the sense that if if they if they aren't happening with HTTP or WebRTC and you can spend and you can do port scanning just as well with both of them, uh, then then web transport should, web transport being unique is is a bug. Um, yeah, I think right now the ongoing work there is the the fin. Oh, did that one get merged? The Finac one got merged, so that's that's progress there. I think that one was recent. There are a few this issues. Up. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know, if you scroll to the bottom. Uh no, not that one. Okay, there's a different one. That's not the spec. Okay, there's a there's a go issue for the Finac one that's maybe not done yet. Yeah, I mean, I guess we still have on the JS side of things, we still need to kind of like polish all of the loose ends and, and kind of uh, once we land on, I, I guess the one thing I was surprised um, with uh, by, by when going through the uh, service worker gateway code is maybe it wasn't sort of a naive expectation that I had, but it was a bit more involved than I thought it would be. Um, again, it's not like... Uh, it wasn't as simple as just, oh, registering the service worker and just intercept passing all the requests to fetch. Like there's more things that needed to happen. Um, but again, like this is just from a naive perspective. Like I, I realize that all of the things that you're doing there, um, Russell, they're like, they needed for it to work. Um, all right. Um, I guess that brings us to an end, unless there's anything uh, we want to specifically discuss. Uh, I I found a CID that it won't load, but it's loading on just about every other gateway. If you want me to share it, I, I don't know if. Yes, help. please. All right. Yeah. Well, I guess here's the question. Uh, what ENS resolver is being used in the Helia gateway? Right yeah, now? no, sorry. If you just grab the hash for like catalog.csv. So. Just trying that with the main gateway. And and it could be I have an old version of your service worker. I need to clear my cache or something. This probably okay, it's transforming yeah. it for me. Well, no, yeah, it won't okay. it won't transform that to because it's case sensitive, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry if I'm jumping around. So it's a case sensitivity thing. So CID v ones don't work as subdomain, um, because they're case sensitive. CID v one or v zeros are so Makes you sense. get to convert it to CID v one. Um, if you do go to sw.sergeantpookie.com, then you should be able to um, load the like sort of demo thing. Is still there like um 
little form and then you can put a CID V0 there and then load as a path. Uh, but you can't load CID V0 uh, as a subdomain. Yeah, no, I'm I'm trying it in the browser. I can't get it to work. And yeah. just in the page, does it work for you? Is it, is it just me? Uh, it's still polling for me. But yeah, it might just be um, hard to pull in the network. But yeah, once I, I can load it in my local yeah. node and then see if, see if, um, I'm just yeah, getting, getting a 404 not found, found Nginx error in the, um, that's fine. I hmm. should take it as a data point. I know it's under. Yeah, appreciate it though. But yeah, that's good to have those edge cases. I would also like to know if it's an edge case and something that I'm doing to, because right now I'm just using IPFS on the command line to add these things with the cron job and, and publish them to IPNS. So. Yeah, I think if, if it loads in the other gateways, then that's something, and it's not in the service worker gateway, then that's something we need to fix. Um, Copy. So, Mosin, you asked the question of how uh, do the trustless gateway concept relate to the IPNI? Didn't you want they to take this one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they 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 don't. Um, so, trustless gateway is just this this spec. Um, which maybe yeah. Thanks. Uh, which allows um returning uh basically you know blocks and cars that can prove a specific a particular path um and ipni is a routing system routing systems are uh i guess to some extent trustless gateway is a fetching system how do i get bytes in this case a proof of some data um and IPNI is for routing. Um, so who has this, who has this CID? Um, the routing V1 um, spec, which, uh, you know, some, some endpoints like CID.contact uh, also speak. Um, is just sort of like a, a generic way of asking someone else to do routing queries for you, um, which can include IPNI queries or could include DHT query, like the amino DHT queries, if you wanted to, I guess, could extend them to be like, you know, mainline BitTorrent DHT queries. doesn't really matter. It's just like a way of asking somebody else to do routing requests for you. This is a, yeah, the, some guy tool that, uh, Daniel just brought up is is one that you know you can sort of hook up to do this by default. It will use the amino uh, DHT and IPM and CID.contact and sort of proxy those results for you. Thank you. Uh, but ideally, to some extent, ideally you'd rather lean more on delegated routing than on trustless gate than on a public recursive trustless gateway. Because you'd rather go get the bytes yourself than have somebody else go get the bytes. Because um, there's a much smaller number. You're sort of if there's 50 people hosting your data, but there are only you know four public gateways that will serve you the, the data. You've like artificially choked yourself. That makes sense. Okay. So I think uh, this brings us to an end. Um...